Uh, we are in week two of a series that we're doing called Jumpstart. And really the, the heart of this series is to look at a new year. We're a couple weeks in here to 2024 and ask the question, well, how do we jumpstart our year? And so we're doing that by looking at some of the major domains of life. And last week, we started off with the most important domain of our life, which is our relationship with Jesus. That if we really want to have a better 2024, if we want to have a life-giving 2024, then it starts with us investing in the relationship we have with Jesus. Not just spending time in his word, but also in applying what his word says so that it begins to shape us and change us into the people he's calling us to become. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at a second domain of life. It, it, it's one of those places that for a lot of us, we spend a significant amount of time of our waking hours in. It's work. Like We often don't think about work as a domain of life that there's an opportunity to bring Christ into, but I want to talk about what that looks like. And of course, knowing that I was going to be talking about work this week, it got me thinking, like, what, what, what was my first job? Uh, what was your first job? Like, I think we can all reflect back and probably remember what that first job was like. For me, um, it sounds really cool, but it wasn't. I uh, was a precious stone sorter. Uh, my family had a small jewelry business back in California, and so my first job was to join the family business, and I had the task of sorting precious stones. And so I would go into work, and I would sit down at a workbench, and they would bring an envelope over to me, and they would open up the envelope on this really nice black velvety pad, and my job was to set aside what I thought were the best stones there were. Like, it was just like, what were the biggest, what looked the nicest, and then what I had to do is I had to then go from there and sort of grade what I thought the stones were. Like, this diamond looks like an A, this diamond looks like a B, this is a solid F diamond, whatever that looks like. And I would spend hours on end just going and sorting these diamonds and putting them into different areas. And I really felt like the job that I had was a significant job because I knew, like, one of these diamonds is going to make it into someone special's ring. And so like, I had to make sure they got the right diamond, the best looking diamond. And so I put a lot of effort and energy into this. And that's what I did. And so for weeks, I would show up for work and I would do this. They'd bring an envelope. They would put it out on the, the black felt thing. And I would sort out all the stones. And I probably should have been like, you know, clued into the fact that at the age of 15, they're like, use your best judgment and feelings on what you think the best stones are. Not really like the most professional of ranking systems. So uh, I just, but I, this is what I did. I went in every day, sorted stones, went home, came back the next day, sorted stones. About two weeks into the job, I remember I had finished up my work hour, or my, my hour, hours, and uh, I had left, and then I realized, like, you know, any good kid, I left the building without asking my dad for money so I can go do something after work, because, you know, that's just how kids are. And I remember I ran back into the building, and one of the workers was taking all of my work and basically putting all the stones together and putting them back in the envelope that I had sorted. For two weeks, I had been sorting the same stones every single day, only for them to go back in the envelope to do it all over again. I realized in that point, like, this job has no purpose. Like, I'm doing nothing. Like, I'm, no one's going to get this stone. Someone far more qualified. There's actually outside grading organizations that, 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 that give grades to stones, not a 15-year-old kid who has no insider understanding. But again, it was like this, what am I here for? Like, why am I doing this? Now, all of us, on some level, we want our jobs to have purpose. And, and of course, tied to that, yeah, we want to make money. The more money we make, the better. The more money we make, the more things we can do. But at the core... We would like the work that we do to have purpose. And uh, of course, like, what does that look like? What is purpose? What's not purpose in a job? It's hard to really describe what purpose is. But the, the, the data tells us that people who have purpose in work will actually be satisfied in work. Uh, re recently, LinkedIn uh, conducted a survey, and they shared in that part of that survey that 73% of people who feel or identify with the work that they do is having purpose are then satisfied with what the work they do. And so again, there's a correlation between purpose and satisfaction. But the problem, like I mentioned, well, what is purpose? Like it can be 
a bit nebulous for people. It is purpose that like the job that you're doing is making a significant difference? Is that where purpose is found? It's purpose, maybe it's not the job that I'm doing, but it's the work of what the, this organization is doing. It's the, out, the output of the business. Like what we're producing, if that's making an impact and making a difference, then there's purpose in that. Like for some of us, that's the purpose we're looking for. For other people, purpose could be like, well, okay, the, the, the work that I'm doing here, I don't really think it makes that big of a difference. And the company that I'm working for, I don't really think that we're making that big of a difference, but the resources that this job is providing for me allows me to support and care for my family. There's purpose in what I'm able to do and provide for my family. We all might have different definitions of what purpose looks like in the workplace, but at the core, we want purpose. We want what we do to make a difference, specifically because so much of our life is given to the work environment. Now, even though it might be a bit nebulous, even though it can be hard to understand what purpose is in the workplace under the world's guidance and standards, Scripture is pretty clear about God's purpose and his design for work. And that's actually what I want us to look at. I want to look at God's purpose for work and then practically how we can begin to live out God's purpose in our workplace. And if you want to follow along with us, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to kind of jump around a little bit, so it might be easier just to follow along in the program. Uh, but just a little backstory to this. Before we get to Genesis chapter 2, uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're, we're reading about the creation of, of, of the world, and God is creating the heavens and the earth, and the pinnacle of God's creation is mankind. Uh, and uh, the first of that creation was someone by the name of Adam. Now, Adam was given the task of caring for, uh, for creation. And this is what we read in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. The Lord God placed the man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Now, the word there, tend, is translated in other versions of the Bible as the word work. That they're almost synonymous in, 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 in their usage. That Adam was placed in the garden to work and to watch over the land. And this was all before the fall had happened. That means that work is good. That work is part of God's plan. It's part of God's design. We don't always think about it that way. A, a lot of us sort of view work as a necessary evil Maybe we might even have in our mind like work is the byproduct of a fallen world, but no, work is part of God's design. God knows it's good for us as people to work, and we don't just read it here in Genesis chapter 2, like we literally see it modeled through the life of Jesus. Uh, many of you know this, but Jesus had a job. Jesus was a carpenter, and sort of that means he was a handyman, he was a contractor, Jesus did a lot of construction work. Like, Jesus worked with his hands. This was his job. This is what he was tasked to do. This is what he gave part of his life to. And there was significant ministry that happened in his work. Now, in today's mindset, we might say, well, Jesus had a secular job. Right? Like, he has his ministry, but he had a secular job. And for a lot of us, we sort of have that same mindset. Like I go to church and I have these places where I volunteer. Like this is my ministry and then I have my job. But when it comes to the perspective of the Bible, there, there is no difference. That what you do for work is also the environment that God has placed you to do the work of ministry. And the purpose of work, and this is so important, the purpose of work is to illuminate God and show his goodness in every domain of your life. Uh, it's, it's true of the workplace. It's true of your home environment. Everywhere you go, the purpose of life is to, is to illuminate the goodness of God and to put that on display, put his goodness on display in every domain of life. And so we have to start thinking differently about what our works look like. It's not just a place we go to make money. It's not just a place we go for eight hours a day. It is a place where we go, where we have the opportunity and responsibility to put God's goodness on display to the people around us. You see, God wants us to use his skills, the skills and gifts that he has given us to point people back to him. And in this regard, there is no 
There's no uh, secular job or ministry job. Everything we do is ministry-minded. And we see this throughout the Bible. Daniel worked in politics. Paul was a tent maker. Luke was a physician. Lydia was a merchant. Their work was their ministry. It wasn't something they did apart from their work. You see, working outside the church doesn't mean that you're working outside the kingdom of God. You have a kingdom assignment. We all have a kingdom assignment. The work environment is the place that God has put us to illuminate his goodness, to reflect his love to the people that we interact with. Now, I I understand as a church, like, we have people here who are stay-at-home parents. And so in that regard, they don't, they don't look like their work environment doesn't look like the traditional work environment. But make no mistake about it. When you're a stay-at-home parent, you are working. You are working in some ways a lot harder than some of us who are going into the quote-unquote workplace. And so when you're home with your kids, you might be thinking, well, this message might not apply to me because I'm not in that traditional workspace, but the job that you have is the same because, again, the purpose of work is the same purpose you have in every area of your life, to illuminate God and to reflect his goodness into the places he's put you. And this is where I think sometimes we get a little mixed up, and I'm not saying stay home parents, but even as a parent, we get mixed up. We're thinking, well, our job is to care for our kids and to serve our kids and make sure all their needs are are met, and so that's what my work is. No, even if you're a stay at home parent, your job is to illuminate God and his goodness to your kids. That's principally what your job is. Now, how you do that, and a part of that is serving your kids, meeting their needs, making sure they're taken care of, but we must never put them ahead of our purpose. Now, at the same time, I realize that some people in this church are retired, and they're like, I get a pass this morning. Like, this message doesn't apply to me, because again, I'm I'm out of the traditional workspace. Like, that's no, that was, yeah, this would have been great years ago, but too late now because I'm retired. I play pickleball. I hang out with my friends. I do some things around the house. Like, this is what I do. But here's what I'd say. You still work. Again, it looks different, but you work in the projects you do around the house. You, you work as you help other people. Some of you volunteer. That's work. Even when you're out there on the pickleball court, you can see that as an opportunity to reflect God's goodness, to illuminate his love in the places that he's put you. And so you think about, even if you're retired, all the daily interactions that you have with people. You can either make those interactions sort of transactional, which we'll talk about a little bit later, or you can see them as a ministry opportunity. Even if you're retired, there's a chance for you to put this into practice in your life. And I get that for some of us, like your students, your high school students, your maybe middle school students, elementary students, college students, and you're thinking, I'm going through schooling so that I can get a job in the future. That's work. This is school. But let me just tell you, if you're in school right now, no matter what grade you're in, if your parents haven't told you this, let me tell you, that's your job. That's what you're like. That's You go to school every day. That's your job to get an education. And so when you're there, how are you leveraging the time that you have there to illuminate God's goodness? to show his love to the people that have been placed around you. And again, this is a mindset shift. Like we have to think about this differently when we step into the traditional workplace, when we step into the, you know, it's 9 a.m. and now I'm a homeschool parent slash teacher. What does that look like? Even as I'm retired, I'm going out and I'm having breakfast with some friends or I'm out to the hardware store. I'm stepping into environment. When we step into a classroom, I'm stepping into an environment. And there's an opportunity to live this moment for myself or to live each moment for God. Now, it can be one thing to to talk about this and to say, hey, part of what we're tasked to do is to reflect God's goodness in every area of our lives. But it sort sort of like quickly bridges to, well, then how do we go about doing that? Like, what are some practical, intangible ways that we can live this out so that we are making an impact in the workplace, so that we're making a difference in other people's lives? And, and I'm not, I'll get there in a second, but let, let, me, just, let me just tell you what it's not. Um, if you're in a traditional work environment, uh, 
illuminate, illuminating God's goodness is not sitting in your office or in your cubicle and blasting Christian worship music as loud as you can so that everyone else gets to hear you play your Christian songs. Like, that, that, that's not illuminating God's goodness. That's noise pollution. Now, we, we like it. Of course, there's some great Christian music, but that's not a conversation. That's just like a, hey, you have to listen to this because you're near me. Too bad. It's also not meaning like that we, we take little Jesus pamphlets and put it in everyone's box. It doesn't mean that we wear what would Jesus do bracelets. It doesn't mean that we wear a cross necklace. Nothing against what would Jesus do bracelets, cross necklaces, or even sharing the good news of Jesus. But it starts somewhere way before that. Way before that action, it starts with you doing a great job at your job. Like if you want to illuminate God's goodness in the workplace, then it begins first and foremost with you doing a great job at your job. Literally be committed to be the best. And that's true, like, regardless of where you sit in the organization. Sometimes I think people at the top, like, well, I have to be the best. And, like, people at the bottom, like, well, I'm just a cog in the wheel. Like, no. Like, God has put you where you're at, wherever that is for the season you're in it. Be the best at your job. A theologian by the name of Martin Luther said it this way. He says, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes. Because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Like it's not just that we put a little like token out there of Jesus. But it's that we're committed to being good at what we do. And through our dedication to what we do, we begin to reflect the goodness of God. Which means for all of us, we can't just be okay with, with, with being with sort of existing in our workplace. And I think sometimes we can fall into that. Like, well, I'm just here. I'm just here to do a job. I'm just here to exist in my workplace. No, we have to be committed to excel in the workplace, to give it everything that we have got. Because when we do that, the people around us will take notice. The people around us might begin to ask questions. And then that starts to open the doors for us to begin to have conversations about why we're dedicated and committed to being the best we possibly can at the job that we've been given. Now, beyond that, there are also some other practical things that, that you can do to help kind of distinguish yourself in the workplace, to kind of leverage your faith to illuminate God's goodness in the workplace. And so I kind of want to talk about that because I know for some of us, we're very much like action-oriented, like give me a few things I can, I can put into practice to help me begin to live this out. And so if you're a note taker, you can follow along, maybe circle one of them that really, really resonates with you. But here's the first thing I would say. If you want to make an impact in the workplace, use kind words. Like, I, I don't know if you've realized, but like, it, it feels like in general, the world that we live in, it's just becoming harsher. Like, people are harsh. Their words, they cut. Like, sometimes people say things, and, I, and I'm not immune to it, right? Like, I do it at times. They'll say things, I'm like, do you hear what's coming out of your mouth? Like, what, what, what do you hope comes out of you saying those words? Because it's not going to be positive. And part of the way that we can distinguish ourselves against everyone else is to be kind, to use kind words. And one of the easiest ways to do it, it might feel old, it might feel a little antiquated, is to like try the you know, tried and true, time-tested words of please and thank you. And again, you might be thinking, Mike, is this the message? Like, you're going to tell us to say please and thank you. We know it, but we don't do it. And you can ask my kids, you know, around the, house, around the house, they'll ask for things. And it's like, if they don't say please or they don't say thank you when they get what they're asked for, they're probably not going to get it again. Like, I'll look at them. They're like, Dad, pass the butter. And I'll just stare at them. Dad, pass the butter. Dad, please pass the butter. Here you go. Thank you. Like, I get it. it, it it's, it's a bit, it's a bit over, overboard for them at times. It's a bit ridiculous for them. But I'm, I'm trying to teach them about kindness. And the words that we use, they make a difference. And what would it look like if we just began to say please and thank you for things? I promise you, if you just committed to do that, you would look different than the vast majority of people you share a workplace with. Kindness stands out. 
But it's not just in saying please and thank you because there's more to it than that. Like, like what would it look like for you to begin to encourage people that you work with? Like to be the encourager. I'm sure you can remember or you can relate to a, po- a point, a season, a moment in your life where someone encouraged you. Like if you've ever been really encouraged, it makes a difference. It's like that I see in you comment. Like I see you doing that. And what you're doing is making a difference. If, everyone, if anyone's ever done that to you, you know that it moves the needle. It, it, it causes you to stop for a second because you feel a wave of maybe uh, of gratitude, a wave of appreciation. You feel seen like maybe you haven't been seen before. And all it took was someone taking just a few seconds to see something you're doing, to call it out, and to acknowledge the hard work that, that is entailed with it. Like if you've seen and experienced that in your own life, what would it look like for you to begin to do that in the life of someone else? Like what if your commitment was just one day this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see something in someone else and I'm going to use kind words to help build them up. If you do that, your work will begin to change. Here's the second thing. Uh, second thing is this, be responsible. Just be responsible. Like this is so important. And like, like this is uh, what we're doing here is we're helping develop a theology of work. Like helping us understand what it looks like for us to live out our purpose in the workplace. And part of that is to be responsible, to work hard, to work with integrity, to do what you're supposed to do or to do the things that you said you would do. And you do this not because your boss has asked you to do it. You do what you're called to do because ultimately you're not serving your boss through your work. You're serving the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul, who was a leader in the early church, he would talk about this in a, in a few different letters that he would write to churches in the ancient world. And I want to share just a few passages with you. He wrote this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He would say, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Like, this includes work. Like, no matter what you do, Do it for the glory of God. And so again, you're not working for your boss. You're working for the Lord. What you do, the responsibility that you show, you're doing it for God. Paul would write this to the church in Colossae. He would say, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Like Paul just directly states the point I'm trying to make. The reason why you're responsible The reason why you show up on time, the reason why you work with all your heart and all your energy, the reason why you give everything you have is because it's what we're called to do. It's because as we do, it reflects on God and it reflects on what you and I believe about God. So be responsible. Go above and beyond. Like if you're set to be at work, don't show up the exact moment you're supposed to be at work. Show up early. Maybe stay a little late. Go above and beyond in everything that you do. Take pride in your work. Show excellence. Avoid excuses and blame, which is prevalent in workplaces. And and even as I say that, I know someone's going to use you as an excuse. Someone is going to blame you for something you didn't do, which is even why it's important for us not to do the same thing back, not to retaliate. Take responsibility even if it's not directly on you. Uh, Here's the third one. And let's just be honest, this one could be hard, um, but I think it's super important, which is to share your life uh, with others. I I mentioned this a little earlier, uh, that uh, in our society, we're really good at transactional communication. And there are sort of uh, defined but unwritten scripts that play out in our daily interactions. And here's one of them. Uh, you walk into the workplace, or really you walk into somewhere, you see someone, you say, hey, how you doing? Like it's what you're supposed to say. Now when you say that, hey, how you doing, what should they answer with? Fine? Good? Like those are the only acceptable answers. 
Like you say, hey, how are you doing? Fine, you can keep on moving. Hey, how are you doing? Good, you can keep on moving. But when they say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, I'm not doing so good. You're like, oh. <laughs> Why aren't you doing good? Like you have to like go off script. And we're like so programmed at these predefined scripts that again, like I, I joke about it, but it's like, it's, it's frustrating when we have to go off script. But one of the things I love about Jesus, and you see about him in his life over and over again, is how interruptible Jesus is. And when he's interrupted, how engaging he is in that given moment. And I think there's something for us to learn from that. Like, we're not just supposed to, like, go through life and go through our workplace playing out the standard societal scripts, but we're, we're supposed to engage with people to take a conversation a little bit deeper. I'm not asking you to like bear your whole life in front of them, but to move a conversation to a different level. And so what does that mean? It means like, look, when a coworker is walking by and they say, hey, how are you doing? You don't just say, fine. You say, you know what, I'm doing really good. And I think part of what makes me feel like things are going really good is I was at church this weekend and the pastor shared this message about but really just giving the best in everything I have. And so I'm just like, I'm here just to live that out in my life. Like that we would begin to take what we believe and inter interweave that with how we live and the people that we interact with. That it becomes a part of all of us. And I get when I say that, some of you are like, no, Mike, that's just weird. Like if someone asks you how you're doing, you start talking about church, like that's just really weird. I get it. It is weird. At times, I will allow that weirdness to get in the way of me actually sharing about the ways that God is interacting with me and moving in my life because I don't want the weirdness. My kids would even say, like, Dad, if, if you were to do that, that's cringe. Like, don't, don't, don't that, that's just, don't do that, Dad. Like, just, just stick to the script. Don't go off script. Don't make it weird. But let me tell you what's weird. What's weird to me is to actually surrender your life to Jesus and then avoid talking about him by any means necessary. Like that's weird. And again, you don't have to be like, you don't have to be like super over the top or, or Christian-y, like, that, like you use all these special magical words that us as Christians have. It just means how do I begin to share what it is that God is doing in my life with the people in my workplace? And again, beyond that, and I, I, I'm not great at this. Like, I struggle with sharing about what God's doing in my life, even with my family. And so, like I'm saying, like, this needs to be something we're all committed to doing better at. That we move off script to get to deeper things. And here's what I would tell you. If you start to move off script in your life, in the interactions that play out, the people you interact with at work will begin to do the same. As you get more transparent about what's happening in your life, they will get more transparent about the things that are happening in their life. And quickly we see that the interactions and the conversations begin to deepen as we start to share life together. They don't just see you for the person who sits over there with this task, but they begin to know who you are through what you do and what it is that you believe. Two more. Serve others. As Christians, we are called to a life of service. Uh, servanthood was modeled to us by Jesus. And that same calling, it exists in our workplace. And again, it doesn't matter where you sit in the organization. Let, let, let me just be honest with you. Like, If you are at the, at the top of an organization, if you're the CEO, the president, you founded the company, like if you sit up there, if you see principally that the workforce's job is to serve you and to accomplish the goals that you have for your company, you will have a work environment where there will be some level of toxicity, that people will struggle. Because when you think that way, you're actually thinking outside of what has been modeled to us by our Savior. Like if you think of your job as the president or the founder or, or whatever it is in the company to serve the people of your company, I promise you the culture of your company will look fundamentally different than if you believe people exist to serve you. Each and every one of us has been called to serve. 
And, and even when, if we sit like in the middle of the organization or lower down in the organization, we still have the same calling. And, and maybe it's not serving the people above us or, or serving the people below us as part of it, but what does it look like for us to serve the people who sit on the same level as us? Like to do things for them just because. To do something for them before they have to ask. And when they do ask, don't be like, oh, I mean, I guess I can make it happen. Like, yeah, I'd love to. I understand saying so is going to, is going to put more on your plate. Every time you serve someone else, it causes sacrifice. Like, we have to sacrifice. We take something more on. But again, this was what was modeled to us by our Savior. That God has given us gifts. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities so that we can use those for the benefit of other people. We read this in 1 Peter chapter 4. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. He's given you a gift. He's given me a gift. He's given all of us a gift. What does he say? Use them well to what? Serve one another. Like God has given you gifts. He's given you talents. He's given you abilities. Not so you can make a lot of money, but so you can use those to serve one another. Serve other people. And as you serve other people, again, you start to illuminate God's goodness and his love into the places that you work. And finally, and probably most important, is to pray. To be committed to praying for the people in your workplace. Again, if you really want to jumpstart your year, if you really want to see God work in all the domains of your life, prayer is one of the best places to start. Prayer is how we deepen our relationship with God. It's how, we, it's how we broaden our connection with God. And all of us have people that we work with who could use our prayers. Even the difficult people. Like in every workplace, there's difficult people. You know those people. Bob, Diane, I'm just making up names now. But like we all have, like when I say the difficult person in the workplace, if your name is Bob and Diane, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say you're difficult. Uh, but like we have these people in our workplaces that like are just difficult. And when we're with difficult people, the last thing we ever want to do for them is to pray for them. But prayer might be the most important thing you can offer that person in that given moment. And this is what we're told in Scripture. Like look at what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, Paul says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Notice it doesn't say, pray for the people you like. Pray for the people that you want good things for. It says, pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. You see, when you begin to pray for other people, your attitudes around those people begin to shift. When you pray for your workplace, your attitude for your workplace begins to shift. When you pray for, for God to open up opportunities for you to reflect his goodness and to illuminate his love to the people in the places we work, your mindset begins to shift because now you're not seeing it as a place that you go work apart from the ministry that you do but you're understanding that God has put you in this place to do the work that he has called you to do. And it all ties together because the more you begin to share your story, I mentioned the more other people begin to share their story, as people open up about what's going on in their life, it gives you and I opportunities to pray for them because now we know what is happening in their life. It all begins to play together. But it starts with a choice. Truly, it starts with you seeing your work for what God intended it to be. To leveraging the eight hours, the 10 hours, the 12 hours, however long your shift is, to leverage the time you're at work for the purposes that God has given us for work. And I've said it a ton. It's to reflect his goodness and to illuminate his love. And so I know this morning that there was, there was a lot 
that I said. Maybe if you didn't take notes, you're going to get home and you'll be like, what were the five things that he said? And you can go back to the program. They're in there. You can, you, can, you can look at them. But here's my challenge for you this week. My challenge for you this week is to pick one of them. Whether it's to use kind words, to be responsible, to share your life with others, to serve others, or to pray like whatever that is for you, choose one and commit to start there. Commit to begin doing that this week. And again, that's true if it's your traditional workplace, if your workplace is your home, if your workplace is your school, if your workplace is wherever God puts you in retirement. Choose one of these things. Begin to live it out and see what God does. Here's what I believe. If we understand God's purpose, if we understand God's design for work, and if we begin to use our lives and mold our lives around that purpose and design, we'll see the needle begin to shift in our workplaces like we never imagined possible. And the more we do it, the more it will become clear that my workplace is my ministry space. And God's got big plans for me while I'm there. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to reflect your goodness, to illuminate your love while we're at work. And God, I know for some of us, work is just something we try to get through. It's something we try to survive, to go on and do the rest of our lives. But God, I pray as people, we'd begin to see our workplaces as you've called us to see them. And that we would live out our faith in the way that you've called us to live out our faith. To help move people. To help our coworkers. To help our supervisors. Find and follow Jesus. Because apart from that, in every area of our life, Nothing else really matters. At least eternally it doesn't. So God, I pray that you would use us, you would challenge us, you would stretch us to make an impact, to draw people to your son Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen.